Now, Spino, just because there's no dinosaurs running around the globe, or that it's called the Boring Billion, doesn't mean it's boring. This was actually a fascinating, if somewhat stagnant, time in Earth's prehistory that not only had some important events, but perhaps gave life the chance it needed to really finish setting the stage for what it would become starting in the Cambrian Explosion. From movies like 65, or shows like Primeval, and walking with dinosaurs, monsters, cavemen, and beasts, you'd be forgiven for thinking Earth's prehistory was nothing but giant, awe-inspiring, slightly terrifying, or strange alien-looking animals that are now extinct and long lost to the Earth's past. A past we can only imagine and study and never yet truly understand. But actually, most of Earth's prehistory was merely existing as a barren rock with only microbial life. And that statement is truest with the Boring Billion, a time where very little happened for a billion years. Seriously, the Boring Billion set the stage for a lot of stuff, but it sure took its time doing it. For most of it, the Earth just stayed stagnant with little geological activity. The surface was a baking supercontinent and uninterrupted black oceans. An alien-sounding world is the Earth we are traveling back to as we talk about the Boring Billion, a topic which is way more interesting than it actually sounds. At this time, Earth was kind of cooking up the perfect recipe for the Cambrian explosion. It just took a while. Early microbial life had a billion years free from serious hardships. That's a long time to test evolution, plenty of time to try evolving into new forms and see which worked. And overall, just get the right recipe that could lead to more complex animals down the line. Combined with a relatively stable climate for all that time, and you had the perfect length of time where low-stakes evolution could trial and error its way to the perfect form without many dangers forcing it to go quicker or drive it in a specific direction. Earth at this time was far from what we see today. It looked like an alien planet with stinking oceans, barren land, and microbial sludge all along the coasts, and a toxic atmosphere with much less oxygen than it has today. Me neither, Smino. So let's observe this story from our very safe distance from it, the modern day, and educate the good people out there on what Earth was like from 1.8 billion years ago to 800 million years ago. Let's get to it, starting with the oceans. This is the boring, not actually so boring, billion. Hey. If you were to travel back in time and visit the Earth at this point, you'd find yourself standing on a barren, dry supercontinent. Maybe Rodinia. The atmosphere would be toxic, so you'd need some kind of special suit to breathe. If you were to make your way across this toxic desert to the ocean, you'd find yourself gazing out at a black sea. Along the shore of the inhospitable ocean, you'd find green slimy goo, the only dash of bright color on the earth. Simple, early life forms, cyanobacteria. At this point there were no awe-inspiring animals like dinosaurs, and in fact, if you looked up at the sun, it wouldn't even be as bright as you'd recognize today. As you stand on the ancient shore, you realize you're on a stagnant, inhospitable planet, and it doesn't feel like the beautiful, lush home we know today. In fact, it would seem to you like the Earth would never escape this rut. What you found yourself on might as well be an alien planet, but it's not. This is your home. This is a tour of the Earth as it was from 1.8 billion to 800 million years ago. Beginning 
with where life originated from in far long ago days, even from the point of view of 1.8 billion years ago. Our oceans. On land, the earth was dry, barren, and rocky. A proper desert planet. But in the oceans, it might as well have been an alien planet. There was a toxic atmosphere which would have been lethal to us, even though this was well after the Great Oxidation event, which introduced large amounts of oxygen into the atmosphere and nearly left the planet sterilized of all life. But that extinction was well in the past by this time, and life was not sterilized and scrubbed away. Though the land was empty, the oceans, however, were the home of what lived at this time. The oceans were a black, stagnant soup at this time, with low concentrations of key nutrients needed for more complex life to evolve. Though oxygen was well established by now, it was still in low amounts, and other nutrients which were lacking included iron, nitrogen, and phosphorus. These might have been slightly more common in lakes or ponds or along the coast, but definitely not out in the open ocean. Oxygen was also likely more common, or only existed, at the surface of the ocean. The deeper you went, the less there was until you suffocated. Large areas of the ocean were simply anoxic. The oceans were sulfuric, and as I mentioned, black or a turquoise color instead of the blue color we enjoy today. Oxygen levels did fluctuate in the boring billion, but throughout the whole thing as a collective, at first glance you'd be forgiven for thinking that things remained unchanged in that black, soupy, stinking ocean. Yeah, yick. It wasn't helped by the sinking dead and decaying matter from the surface. This also choked oxygen out of the deep ocean. The idea of a black ocean is just off-putting. Like, picture the Earth as it is today, and then imagine the oceans as being black instead of blue. It just looks alien. The smell wouldn't have been good either. Not that salty smell we have today, but instead an odor like rotten eggs. Though it's not all alien, a few familiar sites could be found in the oceans. Hydrothermal vents, just like the ones we have today, dotted the ocean floor, alongside valleys, mountains, trenches, vo caves, volcanoes. Truly the floor of the deep ocean would have looked somewhat like it does today. Only somewhat, but it would have offered some familiarity, and that's welcome on such an alien Earth. What life called this stagnant, stinking, soupy, black ocean home? Well, there wasn't anything complex yet. No fish, sharks, or anything like that. What there was included bacteria and simple organisms. Single-celled animals for the most part, with some multicellular animals drifting around here and there. Eukaryotes, which is what all of us are, might have appeared around a billion years earlier than the Boring Billion after the Great Oxidation event. We have fossils of a jellyfish-like animal from way back then. But their evolution was as slow and stagnant as Earth in the Boring Billion. Until the Boring Billion, that is. This was really the age of the eukaryotes building up their army to take over the world. Though overall, the Boring Billion did favor the prokaryotes. At least at first. Changes in the available nutrients during the Boring Billion turn that around, around 1.7 to 1.4 billion years ago, give or take millions of years in either direction, the family groups we have today, fungi, animals, plants, all had their lines diverge from a common ancestor during the Boring Billion, though animals and plants didn't evolve yet, and they wouldn't for a while. This was just where the lines that became them split off. You see, aside from competition with the prokaryotes, there wasn't much to put hardships on the eukaryotes. Once they started to develop, they had plenty of time to experiment with new forms and evolve new types. On screen now is a fossil of the first type of red algae, from 1.6 billion years ago. The eukaryotes diversifying and having time to evolve and try new forms was an important development, and it really helped set the stage for what animals Earth would have in the following millions and millions of years, from the Cambrian animals, to the dinosaurs, to us, and all the other animals alive today. 
So in the interest of not keeping to a single topic for too terribly long, I want to turn to something else interesting. As I've said, Earth in this time was barren, and life hadn't made the full jump to land, a topic we touched on in the Dunkley Osteus video, but there was life on land. Prokaryote colonization of land dates back to before 3 billion years ago, in the form of algae-like sludge consisting of cyanobacterial mats, and these living mats of microbes were still present in the boring billion as well. Photosynthesizing cyanobacteria producing oxygen also caused the well-known banded iron formations, which, to put it simply, map out the oxygenation of Earth's oceans. When oxygen combined with dissolved suspended iron present in the ocean, which formed an insoluble iron oxides, they sank and formed a layer on the floor of the black oceans. The formation showed the waves of this happening throughout the Precambrian. Caves and freshwater rivers, ponds, and lakes also could have been inhabited by surface-dwelling microbes. Simple life was able to live outside of the water long, long before some of the more complex animals began to do it permanently in the Devonian period. Terrestrial eukaryotes appeared around 1.3 billion years ago, right in the middle of the Boring Billion. These took on the form of fungi. The first plants on land were fungi. For a while, way after this, they even got as big as trees before trees existed, but that is a topic for a whole other video. As more biomass appeared on land, it is likely oxygen levels increased enough to allow better conditions for eukaryotes to evolve and diversify. Now, what else existed at this time? Well, to be truthful, we don't know every life form which existed, not just from this time, but all of prehistory. Fossilization is rare. And fossils this old are rarer. So we're working off a fraction of a tiny fraction of a whole because of the fraction that still exists, we can only access a fraction of it. But we know more complex animals didn't exist yet. By the end of the Boring Billion, it wouldn't be too much longer though. But in the Boring Billion, things got complex enough for the first basic food webs to start forming. Nothing, nothing complex or anything, but it was a start. With that said, during the Boring Billion, around 1.6 billion years ago to be exact, is when sexual reproduction first evolved. Multicellular life was also popping up during this time. Stromatolites were also at their height in the Mesoproterozoic before they declined in the Neoproterozoic, which is the area the Boring Billion ended in. It ran right up until the oldest complex animals were evolving in the Ediacaran period, and even slightly before then if you go by some dubious fossils. Getting back to life in the Boring Billion itself, complex food webs didn't form yet due to the limited nutrients available and the lack of complex and higher order life forms which require more energy. So there were just simple basic ones. During all this time, the eukaryotic animals continued to diversify at high rates into the lines that led to animals today, as I mentioned. But many of these early eukaryotes are part of clades which no longer exist. Photosynthetic eukaryotes, such as microscopic algae, were among the animals that called the sludgy oceans home and the shallow water along the coastlines home. Obviously, these were not predators in these early food webs, which were becoming established. They took their energy directly from the sun. For a long time, despite the growing diversification of eukaryotes, the prokaryotes were the dominant life forms throughout the Boring Billion. Microfossils give us a glimpse into a world filled with cyanobacteria, green and purple sulfur bacteria, methane-producing archaea, sulfate-metabolizing, and iron and nitrogen-metabolizing bacteria. Yet despite these animals and others remaining dominant, the eukaryotes were becoming more and more diverse and complex of a group themselves. We have fossils of algae that got a whole 10 centimeters long around 1.5 billion years ago. In a world of microbes, that is the Godzilla of its day. Prokaryotes basically kept the Boring Billion climate in check and in balance. So the eukaryotes had time to experiment and just get their act together. It was the perfect time to try experimental evolution. You see, a billion years of no real hardships was the perfect window of time for life, the eukaryotes specifically, to experiment and find the forms that worked. Because of the Boring Billion, life got going on the more complex path. It had time to experiment and try what worked best, and since we're now here, you can see that they did indeed succeed. The Boring Billion 
let them build the groundwork to eventually take over the world when more complex animals finally appeared in the Ediacaran. And then for real in the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago. And they didn't even have to wait that long though. Less than 100 million years after the end of the Boring Billion, which is getting close to the Cambrian explosion, but still a few hundred million years off, saw the first multi-celled complex animal pop up in the fossil record. That animal was... The Sponge. Of course, people argue about this, so Spongebob popping up this early is disputed. So I think that was a good glimpse into what life on Earth was like at this time. I don't want to make this an hour-long video, so let's shift focus over to the Earth itself, the supercontinents, and the tectonic activity that was going on in the Boring Billion. The Boring Billion saw the births and deaths of the supercontinents Columbia and Rodinia. These were long before the more famous supercontinent Pangaea of the later Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, and Jurassic. But these weren't the first supercontinents by any means. The first was actually Valbera. There were plenty more which were far more ancient than Columbia and Rodinia, which in turn are far more ancient than Pangaea. Though overall the continents really weren't moving around too much in the Boring Billion, there were still two supercontinents which came and went nonetheless. Let's have a tour of these, and then we'll cover other tectonic activity happening during the Boring Billion. First, Columbia. Also going by the name Hudson Land, this was one of our planet's ancient supercontinents. It existed from 2.5 to 1.5 billion years ago, during the Paleoproterozoic Era. That was a lot of big numbers and a lot of big words, but hold on to your butts because we're not being done hit with them yet. Columbia has geological evidence of its existence, which survives to the modern day. From these, we can estimate the size and shape of what Columbia might have been. We've estimated it was 8,000 miles from its northmost to its southernmost points. At the area, it was the most broad. At this time, what would become the east coast of India was attached to, anyone want to guess? Three, two, one, North America! Australia was also attached at the hip to Canada as well. Obviously, this creates a much different map than the one we look at when we see our planet today. Columbia began to fracture and break apart by 1.3 billion years ago at the latest. As for what river and lake systems and valleys and mountains it might have had, we can only guess. Now then, let's commute forward in time and take a tour of Rodinia. Rodinia, meaning motherland or birthplace, was a supercontinent which existed from 1.26 billion years ago at the earliest. It formed from the collision of fragments caused by the fracturing of Columbia. Like I said, the continents didn't move around much, so when Columbia broke apart, Rodinia then formed from its pieces, coming back together. Rodan here lasted until it broke up in the Neo-Proterozoic era, as late as 633 million years ago, which is getting close to the Cambrian explosion relative to the length of time we've been talking about in this video. Within 100 million years or so of the explosion. Shows just how close to what I guess you can call mainstream prehistory some of this stuff gets, as I've pointed out before in this documentary. Rodinia's breakup and the snowball earth it caused are actually thought to have been the final big catalyst for the rapid evolution of complex animal life, which followed very quickly afterward. Heck, that snowball earth might have been what caused eyes to first evolve in animals, but that's also a topic for its own video. Anyway, scientific recognition of the supercontinent which would become known as Rodinia goes back to the 1970s though at the time it was just called Pangaea 1. Very original name there, guys. On screen now is the more accepted reconstruction of what Rodinia might have looked like from surviving geological records. What makes trying to understand this kind of stuff hard 
is that rocks from that time just don't survive on a world that's geologically active like ours. So like I said before, we're working with fragments, and even then, only the fragments we can actually access and study. Like Columbia, Rodinia would also have been barren. No plant life existed on land yet. No complex life existed yet to colonize land. But the green, sludgy cyanobacteria could still be found on the shorelines of what would have otherwise been a barren desert. We also have found in our surviving rocks from the time that the ozone layer was much thinner and discouraged organisms from habiting far into the interior of Rodinia. Rodinia also did have glaciers and ice caps, which would have affected life in the oceans. Speaking of, the globe-spanning ocean that surrounded Rodinia is known as Mirovia. Around the continent, there would have been many shallow seas, and the ocean would have spread out from there around the rest of the world, uninterrupted and a deep abyss for thousands of miles. The ocean would have been empty, though. No large marine animals like we'd see in the Mesozoic, for example. Just microbes and all that empty space. One other thing to make mention of, as this affected life and might explain why life not only didn't evolve much, but was starved of resources for so long. The lack of major movement of the continents contributed because there were no new mountains being made and then weathered down to provide nutrients. The lack of nutrients meant things just stayed stuck. That's not to say mountains didn't rise and fall. Heck, a certain mountain range in the eastern United States today is a scar of one of those ancient mountain ranges that rose in the Boring Billion, and it still plainly exists today, a true relic of the ancient past that still survives today. So many things contributed to keeping Earth in a billion-year-long rut, and this next topic is no exception to that. Let's touch on the climate during the Boring Billion. The Boring Billion itself began after an ice age came to an end, along with a whole lot of other things that occurred before it. The climate change and increasing levels of oxygen had left the world in a bit of a wrecked state, with poor nutrients. Oxygen, however, did drop as the Boring Billion began, and the cyanobacteria bounced back from the hit they took in the glaciation and the climate change roller coasters. The glaciations, the Great Oxidation event, and other events really hit the cyanobacteria hard. That is a whole saga, though. With the large amount of methane early life forms were putting off, it probably meant that the water of the ocean stayed warm for a large part of the Boring Billion. I'll actually pop a graph on screen now which shows the temperatures throughout the Mesoproterozoic, which the Boring Billion was a part of. It's about as boring to look at as the Boring Billion was, but this is the stuff I choose to make videos on. Good thing I love prehistory. That's a joke, by the way. I love this stuff. This is a treat. I love to make this stuff. So, as you can see, Spino, I need you to move. You haven't evolved yet, so get, get out of the way. This video isn't about you. Thanks, bud. Now, as you can see, the temperatures went up and they went down. Like I said, it was a roller coaster. The Born Villain itself, though, as I hinted, was rather warm comparatively to the other eras of Earth. Even though the sun was as much as 18% dimmer than it is today. The fossil record we have show where glaciations occurred, but there were no prolonged ones in the Boring Billion. But as I mentioned earlier, the greenhouse gases being produced by those pesky prokaryotes like methane were higher at the time. CO2 was also higher at this time, and the Mesoproterozoic CO2 levels were thought to have been as high as seven times greater than they are today. But other greenhouse gases like methane were still in higher amounts. The planet was still warm enough for most of the Boring Billion. That ice now likely only appeared at the poles in winter. Now, one theory about why our atmosphere was the way it was actually comes not from Earth, but space. It has been theorized that during the Boring Billion, the Earth was hit by less cosmic rays. It's thought that this was a dry spell for the galaxy's new star formation as well. So, boring billion on Earth, boring billion for the Milky Way. Less cosmic rays actually means less clouds, meaning no glaciation events, and thus maintaining a warm climate. At the tail end of the boring billion was also 
possibly when the neoproterozoic oxygenation event or the second great oxidation event occurred. Smaller in scale than the great oxidation event from long before, this second one saw a very significant increase in oxygen levels in the Earth's atmosphere and oceans, and it might very well have been what finally brought the boring billion to an end. And it continued on for long after it, as late as 540 million years ago. Essentially, this event spanned the amount of time between the end of the Boring Billion and the Cambrian Explosion, a little under 300 million years. For a little context on the sheer amount of time we're talking about here, the Mesozoic Era, the entire age of the dinosaurs, the Triassic to the Cretaceous, lasted about half of that, give or take. 186 million years. And of course, that's just a fraction of the amount of time the Boring Billion actually lasted. Really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? And just as an Ice Age ending marked the start of the Boring Billion, an Ice Age beginning marked the end of it. So in conclusion, my thesis on all of this is this. The Boring Billion had to be boring so we could get all the really exciting things that happened later, from the Cambrian explosion to the dinosaurs to today. Without the Boring Billion, we wouldn't have gotten the dinosaurs or other prehistoric animals before or after, or us. Did so little happen to so much for so long, as the quote puts it, yet that so little was what set up the stage for what was to come. It had to be boring so things could get awesome. It was the calm before the storm. It is the reason our world is the way it is today. Now keep in mind, I only scratched the surface in this video. I gave you enough to have an understanding, but there are other videos out there that go way more deep with this topic than I did. If you want a more detailed dive into this topic, I'd recommend you go watch History of the Earth's video on the topic. I'll link it in the source section of the description. It's a great video, and actually it was my introduction to this topic one afternoon while I was working on assignments in college. So I hope you found the topic interesting. I know Boring Billion as a name doesn't ensure confidence in that, but it's actually a really interesting time in its prehistory, and an important one. I actually find the time on Earth before complex life to be a favorite of mine to research, a ton of really interesting things happened before the Cambrian. Obviously, my biggest fascination is with dinosaurs, but early Earth is really cool too. Speaking of, I'll be, take, I'll be talking about the Hadean Eon soon, and if you guys enjoyed this and are interested, then I could talk about some other pre-Cambrian topics like this afterward as well. Also, if you're new here, I talk a lot about paleontology topics on this channel, so you might be interested in those. I've talked about dinosaurs from throughout the Mesozoic, I've talked about Cenozoic animals, and I've talked about some other animals that lived before the dinosaurs too, like Dunkleosteus and Helicoprion. This was my most ancient though. The Boring Billion was way before any of that, and I really hope you enjoyed and learned something. If you did enjoy and you want to see more videos like this, like and subscribe so that I know you want more, and that's going to do it for today. The next video is before we talk about the Hadeon which I actually wanted to do before this, but that's a little harder to research and this script just materialized first, are going to cover some fun topics I think you guys will enjoy. The next is going to, I'll just tease you with the title, A Collection of Obscure Historical Mysteries. Something much closer to the modern day than The Boring Billion, but something I hope you will all find just as interesting. I have several stories lined up for that one that I think will be new to at least most of you. So until that video, and the Hadean one shortly after it. I hope you enjoyed that you'll check out some of my other prehistory videos, and I'll link a few of those in the description and put some thumbnails at the end so you can see if any catch your eye. I hope you have a good one, everyone, and thank you for watching.